Hello, how's it going? Let me know if uh, you can hear the microphone, but welcome to Computer Science 4303. Um, man, I did not feel like I had a midterm break. I don't know how the students feel, but I feel like I just finished marking exams like two days ago, and now all of a sudden we're back in school, which is crazy. Um, welcome to the course. I've got the uh, course spreadsheet open here. Uh, and I hope you're all doing well. I'm excited to, uh, to teach this course again. This is always a fun uh, course to teach. Um, so let me, uh, before I go into the spreadsheet, let me go over to the D2L homepage. So I'm just going to read through what I've written here and uh, we'll get started with the course. And I've got some slides later. Uh, I'm pretty sure we'll have time for that. Sort of like an introduction to uh, what we're going to be talking about in the course. And um, yeah, so here we go. So if you go on to D2L, here is the, the course page. Um, I believe uh, that you can confirm for me out there in the in the, the live chat that uh, you can access this page now because it's uh, the class has started. So here's the first post that I made a few days ago. So it says, hello everyone, welcome to Comp 4303, AI for video games. Thanks for registering in the course. Here's a bunch of information that I want to give to you. So if you have taken um, a course with me remotely already, this course will operate almost identically to how those courses have operated. Um, but if you haven't, uh, hopefully you have a good time with it. Um, I've gotten some good feedback in the past about how the remote delivery courses have gone. So um, hopefully that stays the same for this course. So uh, if you give me one second here, I just need to make sure I have everything prepared. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, so the first class is today. This is the time right now if you're watching live, at least I hope it is. Yeah, okay. So first thing I wanna talk about is the course website, um, D2L and Discord. So this course will make use of D2L or Brightspace, which we are currently looking at. Um, let me try and make this a little bit bigger. I know the text here can be a little bit small sometimes. Uh, I have a Discord server, which you can join. The links are in the, um, here in the, in the post. So please don't share those publicly. I want to keep Discord to, uh, just students. And a course spreadsheet, which I'll go over in a bit. Um, you can get a link to the course spreadsheet here on my website. So if we go here, this is sort of my teaching website. Um, where I list all my courses. So for example, right now, um, I am teaching Computer Science 4303 and also uh, Computer Science 6980, which is the graduate version of um, 3200, which we, um, which is a technically a prerequisite for this course. So you have kind of already done Computer Science 6980. Here are the links to the Google Sheets for those, um, the lecture playlists on YouTube, which since there are no videos yet, there is no, um, uh, YouTube playlist yet, but if you're watching this past the live stream, you know, like in a couple of hours, this should be active. Um, the syllabus hasn't been linked yet, but I'll do that soon. So all of the, the course information, or at least the public information can be found here. So um, I'll finish reading the post and then I'll go into the spreadsheet and what that means. So all important announcements will be made via D2L. So I believe that you can actually enable email notifications for D2L. So you can turn on, um, you can get an email whenever something is posted to D2L. That's probably the easiest way to stay up to date with the course. I'll try not to spam you with a minor announcement on D2L. Minor things I usually post on the Discord. Um, all assignments will be submitted via D2L. So you've all done that before, you know how that's done. Um, all course files, including assignments, will be available via the website. What does that mean? Um, oh, I think this means, no, it's not. Hang on a second. Oh, I know what that means. Uh, so I am going to be emailing you assignment links and they are hosted on my website. So assignment files, etc., are not going to be, um, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not officially enrolled in the course as a student in uh, at Memorial, then you won't be able to access the files. But I will send you links to those files. I also have a Discord for my classes, which you can join to discuss the course. This is completely optional and not required. However, students have given me a lot of positive feedback that the extra dis uh, discussion and sense of community on Discord make the course much more fun. So please, if you can, go join the Discord. Um, lots of students discuss things and answer questions with each other and stuff. So it's... Um, it's, I think it's a good idea to join the Discord, but I'm not going to force you. Um, just please, if you do, um, don't share the link publicly. 
If that link expires, let me know and I'll send you a new one. And uh, if you do join the Discord server, please right click the server name and um, click edit profile or edit server profile and then set it to your real name so I actually know who you're t who I'm talking to. Like, you know, uh, some guy's name was like Blaze It 420 or something last year and you know, just <laughs> I get it, but um, please change your name to your real name so I know who I'm talking to. All right, this course is going to be focused on the completion of a large scale final project. And we are going to do that in groups of up to two students. So please be aware that the programming load in this course is going to be pretty high. Okay, we're going to have three programming assignments and a big project, a, a big programming project. And you must pass the final project to pass the course, okay? I'm not gonna let you just, just do the absolute bare minimum to get like that 10% that you need to pass on the final project. You, you absolutely need to pass the final project to pass the course. And as we will see when we get into the spreadsheet, um, you're gonna have a lot of time to do the project. But we're gonna have milestones along the way. And please, if you, if you, do not feel like you will be able to do a large scale programming project in a course this term. I would recommend not taking the course. I mean, I would love you to take the course, but if you think that you're going to get through this course without doing a lot of programming, you know, if you look at, for example, the, the prerequisite to this course, 3200, we had a lot of programming in those assignments. So picture that, but instead of exams, we're going to have a project. Okay, so there's going to be quite a bit of programming in this course. Um, lecture delivery information. So if you are watching right now, you've probably read this already. Um, so all lectures will be live streamed and recorded and put on a YouTube playlist as well as on D2L under the course content section. All lecture slides will be available as a PDF on D2L. So I will upload them. They're available for students to view. All lectured will be streamed live on YouTube at the scheduled class time on Tuesday and Thursday. Here is the URL that you are currently watching this on, probably. Um, sometimes it will be difficult for me to interact with chat live during the lectures. Um, so what I do is I stay after the class a little bit. And if there's any questions, I'll stay and answer all those questions. And once all the questions have worn out, then I'll uh, end the stream. Um, this is just a little bit of a caveat here. Like, you know, if you do interact with the stream, I won't uh, ask you to publicly identify yourself, um, but just realize that your usernames may end up on the stream. Um, that's just, you know, if you choose to interact, that's a, uh, not really a risk, but is, is something that will happen. Um, I will never make it mandatory um, to interact with the stream, but you are free to do so. And do not troll the chat. Um, I just, as soon as anyone trolls the chat for any reason or spams or anything like that, it's just insta ban, right? So treat this like a classroom um, for the for the at least the purpose of the of the live stream. And so, um, yeah, don't troll the chat. Ask questions if you have. If they are relevant questions, I'll ask answer them during the lecture. So that was the first announcement. The second announcement is that there is a course survey. So up here, if you go to assessment and then you click on surveys, you should see that there is a start of term survey. Um, please fill that out. And um, I have asked some questions there about your familiarity with things like C++ because we will be using C++ and SFML this term. I will go into all of that once we actually get um, to the assignment, which the first assignment will actually be, uh, be released next week. But I just want to know how much I need to explain C++, what your, um, what your familiar, familiarity is with this. So this is a non-graded survey, but please fill it out because it only helps you um, if you fill that out for me. Okay, and the last thing that I will do is look over here. So this is the first things that you should do. So I would recommend uh, immediately, almost even right now if you want to, because I'm just going to be speaking over this, is to uh, bookmark the live stream link so that you can get back here quickly. Um, join the Discord server, bookmark the course schedule spreadsheet, read the course syllabus, and then fill out the survey. So that's what you should do in the first week. I've got that, you know, just listed down for you. Okay, so let's first look at the course spreadsheet. So if you open up the course spreadsheet, um, you can do that in one of two ways. You can bookmark the actual Google link, or you can go over here um, 
if you go to course content, then there'll be uh, this over here. So important links, lecture slides, lecture videos. If you go to important links, you can see the course uh, spreadsheet that will take you right here. Okay. Um, I think if you open it within the, there you go. It can like open within a embedded thing within D2L. You can do that if you want as well. Um, but it also opens the, uh, the link for you. So let's just look this over. Uh, just keep in mind first and foremost that this course is very flexible. Okay. Um, it has a lot of lectures that we can move around. Um, uh, for example, I may like do this assignment or like I may take this lecture and move it here so that you get more information before the winter break, etc. Um, just keep in mind that this course is this, this schedule is pretty flexible. However, the assignments um, here, these blue ones, these are where, where I discuss assignments, those dates probably won't change. Okay. Um, now to discuss sort of the elephant in the room, and a lot of professors are sort of uh, wondering how to discuss this with students. There is this sort of looming possibility of a strike, of a faculty strike um, within our university. If a strike happens, then we will not be teaching throughout that period of the strike, okay? Um, so for example, in this course, if a strike happens and we miss, let's say half the course, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers. We don't actually know. So for people who have been asking me, faculty have no idea what's going on. We think that there will be a, a, a strike vote next week or something like that. We don't actually know. Nobody, nobody has told us. Uh, everything we know have, we've read from the news, which is kind of crazy. Um, it would be nice to know if this course is going to go ahead as scheduled, but basically what I'll be doing with this course is that if we miss like an entire assignment section, then that assignment won't be done. Okay. It's not fair to you if, if that is the way that things go. However, I may shift things downwards a bit. So if we miss like two weeks here, maybe I'll just shift the whole schedule down. But what I am going to do is that on Tuesday, I'm going to release all of the project information. Okay. So unless the entire course gets canceled for some reason, the project is going to be the main thing that we focus on in this course. So I'm going to give you all of the information that you need to do for the project as soon as possible. So that even if I'm not here, you can still work on the project. Okay. Even if it's just for your own interest or whatever, um, the project is still the project right? So I'm going to give you the project information on Tuesday. It's going to spell out exactly what you do, uh, what you have to do for the project. I have gone through painstaking lengths to write those instructions. So it should be very, very clear what you have to do and step-by-step step along the way, exactly what you have to go through for that project. But we'll do that on Tuesday. And then you can see on Thursday, we are going to go over um, Visual Studio and assignment one. So we will be using Visual Studio and C++ in this course. If you are not familiar with C++, um, I teach another course, which is um, an introduction to game programming. And in that course, I actually have an introduction to C++. So down here, um, you can see that there are two links here, introduction to C++ 1 and 2, and then um, a tutorial on VS Code, C++ and Make. So you can use Visual Studio if you want. If you're on Windows, please use Visual Studio. If you are on Mac or Linux, please use VS Code and the make file that I provide. So if you look over here, um, this link goes to a YouTube video, which is from my computer science 4300 course. And that core, these videos, oh, sorry, that's the wrong link. I will change the link. It should work by the time uh, this lecture is over. This is actually a private video from a previous year. But if you don't see that, um, how about this? You go to my teaching website, you come down to uh, Computer Science 4300, you go to that Google Sheet, and then here you see C++ 1 and 2. Um, you have an entire course here of game programming and a C++ introduction. So if you want, if you're not familiar with C++, I didn't want to take up too much time in this course giving like explicit C++ lectures. They are available on from my other course, okay? So if I just view, and I, I zoom in here. This is the computer science 4300 course and anything you want to watch, um, you are able to do that 
here. So if you want to learn more about SFML, if you want to learn more about C++, you can watch it in these lectures. Okay. Um, so that's what this is. As I finish the lectures, the links will pop up here. Most of you have done uh, Computer Science 3200, so you can know kind of how this goes. Here I've got some, some useful links down here. If any of these are broken, please let me know. Just send me a DM on Discord and I'll fix those right away. Um, also, what I have here is uh, some past project trailers. So you can watch the trailers, um, the YouTube trailers from previous year's projects. And I have included, in case you want to get started very, very quickly with your project, I have included last year's setup videos, okay, for both StarCraft and Minecraft. Now, a couple of things in those videos has changed very slightly, but I think if you watch those videos today, you would be able to set up the project by this evening if you want to. Now, of course, you know, you don't have to do that. It's still the first day, but I'm just showing you that all of the information at least from a previous year's perspective, is here if you want to get started with the project, okay? Um, okay, and then the project is due on the last day of exams. So you currently have 101 days <laughs> to do the project from right now. Okay, you can see exactly how many days there are to do stuff. Now, I suspect that most of you will not start the project until the middle of the term, um, when I give those instructions and that's fine. You'll have more than enough time to do the project, but just, I keep saying the word project, so it's probably pretty important. Um, how important is the project? Well, if we go over here to the grades section of, um, the D2L, you can see here that the, um, assignments are worth 35%. So we have three assignments and the project is worth 65% of the course, okay? So the project is worth a lot of the course and you have to pass it in order to pass the course. So that's the course spreadsheet. And now what we can do is we can go over the course syllabus. So if you click here, you will be taken to the course syllabus. So let's go over the course syllabus. Um, a lot of this will probably be things I've already said, but whatever. Um, so I am David Churchill. My office is in ER, that is Earth Science, not Engineering. So my office is over in um, Earth Science Building. My office hours are Monday afternoon. So Monday, 2 to 4, usually I stay in my office. Um, don't call me. Send me an email if you actually want uh, me to respond to you. Um, I never check my office phone. Uh, my website is here. You can go to that and get links to all the cool stuff. Uh, so the course objectives. This is a course for students interested in learning about various techniques for artificial intelligence in computer games. Topics include an introduction to movement in games, search and planning, decision making, and procedural content generation. Implementation of course assignments will be done using the C++ programming language and the SFML graphics library. A final course project will be to implement an AI bot for a retail video game. So in our course, that will be either StarCraft or Minecraft. Um, you will be doing a StarCraft project if you have access to Windows, because unfortunately it's really only feasible if you have a Windows machine handy. If you do not, then you can do the Mine Minecraft project. Course outline. Um, I'm not going to read over all this, but we'll essentially be going over like an introduction to C++ and SFML. I have those videos linked for you. Introduction to game AI. That's what I'm going to talk about a bit today. We'll talk about movement in games, uh, procedural content generation, decision making in games, um, game AI competitions, and bot creation. That's going to be all about the, um, the project. There's an optional textbook here. Um, it's called Beginning C++ Through Game Programming. I just wanted to put something there. Um, it's not like an amazing book, but it's okay. So you can go look at that if you want. And of course, CPP reference. If you Google anything about C++, that's what you're going to find. Um, this is incorrect. Wow. Okay. So two lectures per week, Tuesday and Thursday. I've got to fix that. That's uh, 1030 <laughs> to, to noon. So uh, that's incorrect. Apologies. But this is correct. Um, here is our final grade. Um, that's how this will be determined. So this is the marking scheme for the course. So assignments can be done in up to two people per group. Um, so here is uh, her, here are the three assignments that we'll be doing. And the project and the final presentation for the project can also be done in groups of up to two people. Most people keep the same groups for their assignment as for the final project. Uh, you don't have to do that, but you're more than welcome to. This is very important um, because this course is, a lot of it is online. Um, in order to show that you have learned the material, you must pass the final project to pass the course. 
okay? If your grade on the final, uh, this is supposed to say project, apologies for the typos. If your grade on the final project is less than 50%, then your overall course grade will be equal to the mark that you received on the project. So if your project grade is greater than 50%, then your course grade is determined by this above. So don't be freaked out by that. Like you would really have to really not do a lot in order to, to, to fail the final project. It is a lot of work, but it's not like difficult work. It's just a lot of work, right? So as long as you put the effort into this course, then you will pass the final project. So um, that is just a, um, a note on, on having to pass the, the final project. Um, here's a thing that, you know, you've probably heard me before if you've taken a course with me, but I'm gonna read it again. I take academic misconduct very, very seriously, especially for remotely delivered courses. Anyone found cheating this course, uh, cheating in this course will receive the harshest possible academic penalties. So I completely understand. I trust me, I did a lot more school than you did. I, I was in university for a total of about 14 years, like between two, like two undergrad or a joint undergrad degree, master's degree, PhD. I know what it's like to be a student. Students can get sick. Students can have emergencies. Students can have all sorts of things that can delay their work, right? So there are, there are excuses for not handing an assignment in on time. There are excuses for needing an extension on an assignment. There are excuses for not knowing how to do something that I can help you with. But trust me, there is no excuse to cheat, okay? There is no excuse to cheat, no matter what happens. If you... For example, I don't know, if you're very ill or you get into a car crash or a loved one dies or whatever, and you miss assignment three, if you know you're going to miss that, it's way better to just tell me, hey, this thing happened. I'm not going to be able to do the assignment. I could, for example, move the weight of that assignment onto your project. Okay. But what you should not do is like pay somebody... <laughs> in Russia to do your assignment for you. That's actually happened before. And it was very obvious that that the person had not done that assignment. So please do the assignments yourself and don't cheat in the course and you'll be fine. And if anything happens for any reason where you need extra time, come to me before the due date, okay? So my general rule is if an assignment, if you've been given two weeks to do an assignment and you need an extension, you have to come to me before the due date, all right? If you come to me on the day that it's due and ask for an extension, you won't be getting an extension, all right? Because that just tells me that you waited until the last day to start the assignment. So if you need an extension, if you're getting sick or whatever, if there's anything else going on, just email me. I'm very, very lenient with that as long as you do not wait until the final day to ask me for that extension. All right, so what do I consider cheating in this course, or academic misconduct, I guess, if you want to speak uh, lawyer speak. So handing in any material for evaluation that was done by anything or anyone outside you or your group. And trust me, I know about chat GPT. I know about all the other systems out there that can generate code, right? I have used, um, what's GitHub's thing? GitHub's like super autocomplete thing. Copilot. I know about Copilot. I know about ChatGPT. Uh, there are tools now. There are giant neural network research tools that you can paste in code or paragraphs or whatever that have that have been done by those systems, and you can tell if those if that code or if that paragraph with a high degree of accuracy has been generated by an AI system. So. I know they exist. I probably know more about them than you. It would be a very, very bad thing for you if you tried to use AI tools to help you pass this course, okay? I consider using any of those AI tools to generate code for this course to be the exact same thing as if you had gone out and gotten another human being to do it for you, okay? So I'm telling you upfront that those things are not allowed. All right, so, so please don't use them. And if we catch you using them, because it's pretty easy to catch people using them because the code that it generates is actually pretty bad, um, you'll just get a zero in the course. 
All right, so it's really not worth it. It's just not worth it to do that, okay? All right, obtaining solutions from any non-class source, such as outside of your group, previous course offerings, stack overflow, etc., unless specifically stated otherwise. So for example, when it comes to the project, and I'll show you this in the next lecture when I detail the project, I say in the project, hey, um, for the StarCraft bot, you can go out and look at other StarCraft bots and be inspired by and even take some of their code and bring it into your StarCraft bot. That's fine because it is explicitly stated that you're allowed to do that, okay? And you have to cite it, but you're allowed to do that. But for the assignments, 100% yourself, okay? And unless specifically stated, you have to do the work in this course. I shouldn't be having to say this for a fourth year course, but you'd be surprised. I'd still probably, if I had to bet $1,000, I would say two people are going to cheat out of the 40 or so that are in this course. All right. Um, sharing assignment or exam questions outside of the course for any reason, including ass assignment sharing websites or online repos such as GitHub. So if you end up posting your code on GitHub in order to share with your partner, it has to be private, okay? It has to be private, do not make that public. I am considering, you know, if you post your code publicly anywhere to some uh, uh, assignment sharing website like Chegg or anything like that, I regularly monitor that. I take down things all the time with DMCA requests. Um, if you post it there, I'll probably know about it. And you'll know why once we do assignment one, because your personal information is going to be embedded into all the assignment files. Okay, so please do not post any assignment files online for any reason. And don't try and reverse engineer any of the code that I give you. I mean, I don't know really why you would. It's harder to do that than it is to just do the assignment in the first place. Um, Memorial University policies. I mean, you can go read all this legal stuff on your own. Um, there's supposed to be something here about COVID as well. This is a remotely delivered course. We don't need to worry about COVID. Um, as I said previously, the only thing we would have to worry about possibly is a strike. And I don't know anything about that yet. So we're going to proceed on, um, as normal until I know what's happening. And if I ever know what's happening, you will be the first people to know about that. All right. So that is um, all the information about the course. Um, so let's start with a little bit of a lecture. So I have some slides here. If you have taken Computer Science 3200 with me, you have probably seen um, about half of what I'm going to show you before, but not everyone in the course has. So let's look at the PowerPoint. Oh, my PowerPoint is displaying on a different screen. So give me a second. Slideshow monitor Dell. There we go. Now you should see it. Perfect. And at any time, if you have any questions, okay, now, actually now is a great time to ask questions if you're out there in the chat. Um, I'll happily answer them. This is a pretty chill lecture in terms of uh, material. I'm just basically going over, you know, what is academic AI, what is game industry AI, etc. So if you have any questions, please just post them and I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. So I don't see any questions out here. So let's just do uh, the first lecture. So lecture number one in the course, I'm explaining kind of the difference between academic artificial intelligence and what some call industry or game industry artificial intelligence. Because believe it or not, um, there is a bit of a difference and we will be doing more of the game industry AI uh, in this course. So first, let's talk about academic artificial intelligence. And if we looked at Computer Science 3200, um, that is sort of more academic artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, um, what, what does that really mean? Well, you know, there's a lot of different definitions. If you asked 100 profs, you'd probably get 100 different responses. Here's sort of just a one-slide overview. Intelligence sort of means the capacity for either learning, reasoning, understanding, or problem-solving, or decision-making, okay? Um, artificial intelligence, then, is building a program or a machine that appears intelligent to the user in some domain, right? So a machine that looks intelligent or does some sort of decision-making. Um, or if you're a company nowadays, 
artificial intelligence literally means anything, right? So, oh, our system has AI because it has an if statement in it. Like, okay, maybe that's <laughs> industry AI um, these days, but you know, we're gonna actually give definitions here, not just marketing. You may have also heard of a, like a strong AI or a general AI. And what that means is that they're trying to build a system that's sort of good at everything, right? So that doesn't exist yet, but whether or not it'll exist, who knows? I'm not here to speculate, just give some definitions. So artificial intelligence, uh, the term was coined um, by John McCarthy, one of, uh, you know, the sort of grandfathers of AI and computer science. And he said that uh, it is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. It is related to the similar task of using computers to understand human intelligence. And here's the important part, but AI does not have to confine itself to methods that are biologically observable. Right. So if you go out there nowadays, people will tell you, oh, um, machine learning is artificial intelligence. Right. Because that's how the brain works. Well, not really. Um, and trust me, machine learning is not all of artificial intelligence. So what is academic AI then? Academic AI, typically, there's exceptions to all these rules, is concerned with creating the most intelligent system for a set of tasks using any available resource, right? So academic AI is like, I have this task, maybe it's self-driving cars, right? Create the best system for that using anything that we can. Um, because we want to publish research, or sorry, perform research and publish papers. That's what academic AI is about. They're interested mostly in theoretical performance. So, you know, how long does this, um, or what's the, What's the big O notation of this algorithm, et cetera. Interested in things that can be proven sometimes. Um, usually interested in non-game related um, problems. And typically for academic AI, there will be very few end users for their work, right? So if you publish a paper, the vast majority of the code that is published for papers never gets used by anybody. In fact, it never even gets used by the researchers again. You, you write some code, you, you do some research, you get some results, you publish a paper, and then that's it. Your code is lost in a private GitHub repo um, until BitRot destroys it at the end of time. So academic research, now of course there's exceptions to that. Some academic research is very uh, popular and, and gets used, but for the most part, academic use research has very few end users. So what do you do to actually perform academic AI research? Well, first you identify a problem or an area um, to work in. So for example, let's say you are interested in doing a master's in game AI and you come to my office and you say, hey, I've heard that I can do a master's in game AI and all of this is true. Um, I have several students who are doing master's in game AI right now. And you say, how do I do that? What is, what is involved in academic research? What would I be doing as a master's or a PhD student? Well, the first thing we would do is we would sit down and we'd brainstorm about what topic you actually wanted to work in. And usually there's one of two things that happens. One is um, you're interested in a very specific problem, right? So I love StarCraft. I want to work in StarCraft, right? Or you would be interested in a very specific solution. So you would say, I love uh, neural networks. Let's do something with neural networks, right? So you're either area identifying a problem or an area of solution to work in. Then what you do is, I, well, maybe I would say, okay, that's a good idea or a bad idea based on knowledge that I have. But what we have to do first, after you've identified uh, an area, is review the literature of existing techniques, right? Because in academic research, you cannot do something and be in second place. You cannot publish if someone has already done it before. It just doesn't exist. Uh, the, uh, sorry, it already exists, so you can't do it, right? Because if you publish something second, it means that you could have just copied the research that was done first. So you have to make sure that nobody's ever done it before. So that's a, a review of the literature. You go read a bunch of papers. Then you're going to develop some new techniques, right? So, so new generalized techniques that, um, that work in a bunch of domains or a new StarCraft algorithm or something like that. 
Then you test the new techniques against the state of the art, this is what this is, under specific control circumstances. So does my new um, combat algorithm work? Is it better than old combat algorithms? Well, we've got to test that somehow. So maybe we play a bunch of StarCraft games. Based on the results of those tests and those experiments, um, we would analyze that data and say, okay, can we publish those results? Well, if it's better, then we can publish them. If it's not better, then we can't publish them. So you've got to have better results. Um, so a master student would spend between two and three years um, doing first year of like coursework and then some AI research. A PhD student would spend between four and seven years. Yes, seven years. My PhD took seven years. It's a bit of a long story, but it took a while. Um, between four and seven years working on some subfield of AI to produce a new algorithm or a new system, etc. If you're Google, you just spend a hundred million dollars on deep learning, learning to play Go and StarCraft, right? So this is, this is a bit of difference between academia and, and industry. So categorizing artificial intelligence. How do we sort of break down this big term of AI that's sort of encompassed everything recently, which is kind of annoying as, a, as an AI researcher. So you can break down AI one of two ways, either in the algorithmic techniques used to solve problems or in the application domains in which they will be applied. Right? So over here, an algorithmic technique might be heuristic search. It might be uh, machine learning. Whereas over here, application domain might be self-driving car, might be robotics, might be StarCraft, poker, whatever, okay? So here's a little bit of a, an application domain view of artificial intelligence. Uh, it kind of has, kind of, it's, it's both, a bit of both. So here we have things like machine learning, natural language processing, speech processing, expert systems, planning, scheduling, robotics, vision, all sorts of topics in AI these days. Um, my research kind of focuses on uh, these areas. So robotics, planning, scheduling, optimization, and a little bit of reinforcement learning. I don't, I don't really care for um, neural networks that much. So you're looking at this and you're like, what is the current state of the art? Um, the current state of the art, if you ask most people, they will just say machine learning, but it is not just machine learning, okay? I hate that because it is, it is both machine learning and heuristic search. Heuristic search is not dead yet. I know maybe I'm just an old man yelling at a cloud. Um, I guess literally I'm yelling at a cloud because I'm on YouTube, right? Um, but it's a combination of machine learning and heuristic search. So what is machine learning? Well, I'm not going to get too much into machine learning, but there are basically three huge subdomains of machine learning. One is supervised learning. Um, where you are given labeled data and you try and learn a model to fit that data. Um, unsupervised learning, which is this sort of data-driven clustering type approach that finds patterns in data. And then there's reinforcement learning. Um, and if you've, you know, if you've done the prerequisite for this course, 3200, you know all this stuff already. Then we have search-based AI, which we also learned about um, in 3200. And this is like heuristic search, things like this. So search... In the past, researchers would pretty much either focus on using search or machine learning. They would not use both. But recently, and I mean in the last like four or five years, researchers have gotten their best results by combining the ideas of heuristic search with um, machine learning. Okay, so for example, AlphaGo used heuristic search and deep learning. It used heuristic search in the form of Monte Carlo tree search and deep learning to train policy um, and um, value networks, right? Even AlphaGo Zero, which did not take this approach, still used Monte Carlo tree search in its reinforcement learning, all right? So now whether or not you want to classify MCTS as, as reinforcement learning, I would say that it's still heuristic search. So it's both. Okay, so I know this is a little bit rant-like, but it's just really annoying when you turn on the news and everything you hear is, oh, it's just machine learning, just machine learning, just machine learning. It's not. All right, so what can AI actually do? Um, as I said before, there's lots of domains, planning and scheduling, for example, all the routing algorithms in Google Maps, that's all AI. 
uh, autonomous control. You hop into a Tesla and try to get it to take you somewhere. That's going to be AI. Um, image and pattern recognition. If you, uh, all of your mail has been scanned by AI for the last 30 years. Um, if you go to, you know, through some airport, you're probably being facially recognized now, which is a terrible thing that should never exist. Um, but it happens. So that's AI. We've got healthcare AI now where AI systems can actually like scan brain tumors and stuff and, and identify them. We've got robotic telesurgery that can happen. We've got robotics. So over here, we've got swarm or nano robotics. Um, we've got uh, bigger robotics over here training, you know, teasing this robot into becoming Skynet, I guess. We've got musical AI. Um, uh, this is Compressor Head, the band. They don't actually write their AIs, but there are AIs out there that write music. We've got AIs doing art. Um, so I'm sure you've all by now heard of, at least heard of, but maybe used these like art generating algorithms. So I have cats and I have ferrets. So I uh, did this recently. I said, hey, AI system, generate an oil painting of a ferret in a wedding dress getting married to a black and white cat in a tuxedo standing near a lake. It does a pretty damn good job of it, in my opinion. I really like this one. Actually, I might get that one printed. But it's just, it's hilarious. Like, look at how good that is. I don't know. It's just crazy. Um, here's a ferret holding a magic wand and casting a spell by the ocean. That's, that, I think that that's what that is. It's, it's pretty crazy. Not only that, but when it comes to video games specifically, you could say, generate a top-down view of a new dungeon map for an RPG game. Right? So AI can be used for all sorts of crazy stuff these days. Um, also, we've got like procedural content generation for games. So making levels, etc. cetera. Uh, language processing and translation. That's been around for a long time. Uh, taking over the world, obviously. Um, game playing. That's what we're going to be doing in this course. So you've got um, like board game, AI, Go has, has been... I wouldn't say solved, but it's it's way better than humans now. We've got StarCraft that we're going to be writing AI for in this course. Um, so a lot of people are applying AI to game playing these days. So back when I sort of said, all right, academic AI, there's a part where we test the new AI system, right? So how do we test new AI? Because AI, it's artificial intelligence. So what would a better AI system really mean? Well, it might mean that it's smarter, right? How do you test for intelligence? It's kind of really difficult. And so what people have been doing is to say, okay, let's take a domain where it's kind of easy to test for intelligence, and that's games. Because like, for example, if you're playing Go or chess or checkers, um, you're testing for intelligence in that domain. So if you have a new algorithm, then if it plays chess better than the old algorithm, it's probably smarter. Right? I almost said more smarter just then. Oh, God. All right. And that's because games measure intelligence within that specific domain of that game. And in my opinion, everything is a game. Not just video games, but everything in life is a game. Why is that? Well, let's look at the definition of a game. You have an agent in an environment. That agent can take actions. The actions affect the environment. And that agent has a goal. Either defeat the opponent, go to the right, solve a puzzle, get the most points. You're just maximizing a function, right? So in the real world, maybe I'm trying to maximize my happiness, maximize my money, maximize my friends, right? But the real world is, is pretty much a game. It just has better, uh, bigger consequences than something like Space Invaders, right? So AI in games, um, it's really important, I think, and it's become huge in the in the academic research field so games can simulate the real world and therefore ideally game ai success translates to the real world um, you don't need ethics for games uh, it's very cheap to um to play games in comparison to building robots or doing experiments in the real world they're easy to visualize they're intuitive to use they're fun to program and play and they really do help people um, by motivating them to learn more about ai and, you know, 
they make the headlines. So, you know, we've had uh, chess playing computers. This is when Deep Blue defeated Kasparov. We have uh, AlphaGo defeating Lee Sedol. We had the Jeopardy machine defeating Ken Jennings and the other guy, I can't remember. Um, and we have poker AIs that defeat humans as well. So it's it's kind of cool, this sort of human versus machine uh, race there that AI is, is eventually pretty much going to dominate in every game. Um, I just did that duplication of the slide so this human versus machine um most games are computers are now better at right and we've still basically got like starcraft and maybe like dota or something like that at least the full five versus five game where computers are at least not dominating humans but they may be catching up so for academic ai again we want to publish new ai techniques so the goal is to create the most intelligent system and then apply it generally maybe to the real world or other problems that are maybe more important than video games. So researchers test their new techniques in various games, um, but games may not be the end goal of academic AI research, but instead they are the test environment for their research. Industry game AI, so all of that was sort of academic AI. Now I want to, the only reason I really said that was to show you what the difference between video game industry AI and academic AI. And so there's a, there's a real unfortunate trap that most people fall into and I fell into, you know, a decade ago, which is to basically think that academic AI is the smart AI and industry AI is the dumb AI. But that is not it whatsoever. Trust me. Now that I've actually, I've actually made an AI system for like a retail game, it's probably harder to write retail AI. Um, and I'll go into some of those reasons. So for industry video game AI, basically the game designer needs an AI feature, right? Hey, we are designing this game. Some AI needs to be in it. Like maybe you have this NPC that follows you around like uh, Elizabeth in Bioshock Infinite or something like that. Or it could be as simple as uh, Goomba moves left when it sees Mario, right? It could be something very complex or something very simple, but an AI programmer has to implement that some fast. Uh, I was reading the, geez, I was reading the next slide. And somehow, an AI programmer has to implement it somehow. And it has to run very fast. Um, in academic AI, your algorithm can take five minutes to run. It doesn't really matter, right? But, in video game AI, you might have a millisecond to run your AI. A millisecond if you're lucky, okay? So you have less time, less computational budget. Um, not only that, but it has to work, right? You can't have bugs in your... You can't just run your video game again if it crashes. It has to not crash, right? And so you've got less budget than academic AI, um, less time than academic AI. Sometimes, most of the time, the AI for a particular industry or video game, for example, is often less generalized and more rules-based, right? So a lot of the time, the AI system for a video game will not necessarily be as complex as the AI system for an academic system, okay? And I say hard-coded here, I don't mean that in a negative way. What I mean is it's more targeted for this very specific environment, right? Because an academic AI system would, for example, want to solve problems in all sorts of domains. And if you introduce generality into an AI system, then there's overhead associated with that generality. But we do not want that, in, that uh, overhead in an industry setting, right? This AI system is only going to be working in this game so it can be more hard-coded toward that game. And the resulting AI has to be very, very stable. It has to be used by probably millions of people. It can't crash. It can't go over time. It can't cause lag in the game. Uh, but in academic AI, I don't really care how fast my program runs. I can just leave it there all night, right? So that's, that's a huge difference between academic and industry AI. So, industry AI is not worse AI. It's just a different goal, right? The goal of the AI is to entertain the player, not to be the most intelligent. 
So technically, it's not to entertain the player. The goal of an AI from a game industry point of view is to help the game sell more copies, right? But that's the business point of view. The game designer point of view is we want the player to have the best time. And the problem is fun is a much harder goal to optimize than any academic AI problem, right? In academic AI, you're going to say, okay, win the most chess matches or find the path that's the shortest, right? It's these really easily numerically definable problems, but the AI system in an industry video game is make the player have the most fun. How in the hell do you optimize that? It's actually, I would argue, a harder problem than academic AI to formulate the goal that you're trying to achieve. So industry AI programmers often have much deeper knowledge of implementation of AI system than academics due to their constraints. So academic AI researchers typically have a better theoretical knowledge of algorithm systems, but when it comes to implementing and writing stable systems, industry, industry people often know how to write the algorithms and implement them better, um, implement them faster, more reliably, more safely, if that's a word, um, because of these constraints that they're working in. So the AI for a video game should be exactly smart enough, but not smarter than necessary. Because in order to make something smarter, you have to spend more time on it, right? And if you're in any company, you want to spend as little time as possible creating things. Um, the intelligence required depends on the interaction between the agents and the players. The longer the AI interaction on the screen, the more likely it is to look dumb, right? So it's easy to misinterpret the intelligence of things in, in games. I'll give a couple of examples of that later. And game AI isn't just intelligence, right? So game AI often involves aspects of games that aren't strictly intelligence. It's good animation is good AI, right? You could have the best path in the world, but if it follows it in a way that's not animated correctly, then it, it looks dumb, right? So one of the more frustrating things I've ever done in my life is create an AI system for a game and that was actually like on Steam and then look on Reddit and see people saying, oh, it's so dumb, it did this. It's like, yeah, but it did all these other smart things too, right? So if it, if it looks dumb, it is dumb. Good AI is good game design. It's good sound design. Good AI studies human behavior. If you're doing a game like Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, if you go up and say hello to somebody and then you walk away and you come back and say hello again, if you were in the real world, would they say the exact same thing? Right? Probably not. And so you've got to know human behavior. You've got to know good game design, what's fun. It's a hard problem. I would argue that like really good industry game AI is harder than academic AI. So how do we build good AI? We need to observe the world. How do people move around when they're having conversations? How far apart do people stand? How does a new person join the conversation? How do people avoid each other when they're walking in the street? How do we adjust our gaze as we're looking at people, right? It's real hardcore AI systems have to talk about all of this stuff. Now, we're not gonna be talking about animation and, and a lot of these things in this course, but just be aware that like as a whole, building AI systems for like large games is very, very difficult. Game AI implementation. It turns out that exaggeration is often the key because believe it or not, your users can be kind of dumb. <laughs> I don't want to, well, okay. Maybe that's a little bit harsh. Um, it's true, but harsh. People, if they can't notice the AI, then, then they don't know it's there. Right? So here's a, here's a story that I'll, one of the two stories that I'll, I'll just read this out. So this is, this was written by the person who did, um, the Halo AI. In Halo, the grunts run away when an elite is killed. Initially, nobody noticed this. So when you, there's like, there's a bunch of grunts and then there's an elite who's sort of the leader of the pack. 
And what they wanted to do was if the leader is killed, the grunts should run away, right? But none of the players were actually noticing that that was happening. So we had to keep adding clues to make it more obvious. By the time we shipped, we had made it so not only does every single grunt run when every single, uh, every single time an elite is killed, but they also have outrageously exaggerated panic run where they wave their hands above their head and scream in terror. And half of the time, one of them will say, leader dead, run away. And I still estimate that less than a third of our users made the connection, right? So in this sense, what they're trying to do is teach the player Hey, you don't need to kill all the grunts. If you kill the leader, the rest of them will run away. And that's an AI problem, right? Is how do you make that? Um, like, how do you show the user that this is actually happening? And they said, still, most people didn't get it. Um, there was a story that I heard at a conference once from the person who wrote the original AI for Warcraft 2. Um, so they worked at Blizzard, obviously. And um, so here is a Warcraft 2 unit over here called a Zeppelin. And so each of the races in Warcraft 2 has a Zeppelin. It's a flying unit that can't do anything. It just scouts the map, right? So in a, in a real-time strategy game, you have like this fog of war. And as you're going around, you uncover parts of the map. And so the AI programmer, um, <laughs> the way that units were... The way that AI units worked in Warcraft 2 in this specific map is they didn't... So the user has to create a base and they are going to be attacked by waves of units as they move around the map, right? And so the, the AI programmer was like, okay, I don't want to have to like create a base for the AI and have them mine gold and do all this kind of stuff. So all that happened was that as you walk around the map, um, the AI system would spawn some units just out of your vision and they would come attack you. Really simple system, right? So one day, uh, oh, and, and on this one map, uh, this one map that they were doing, you sort of, what happened? So you walked through and then you got safely to this part where you had to build uh, like a base on the ocean, right? And in, in Warcraft 2, you could build these transport ships. So you needed to build like a shipyard near the ocean, etc. And in this particular level, there was an enemy Zeppelin that would just go in a pattern around the map. And it would take like two to three minutes to, to complete the whole circuit. So the Zeppelin would be up here. It would just do like a loop or a figure eight or something like that around the map. And it would take some amount of time. And so... What happened was, like, the CEO of the company came to do a play test one day and test out the AI system. So the, the CEO was, like, taking its units toward, like, this area that, that was saying, okay, you need to make your way to this area. And as soon as he got to this particular area where he was supposed to build a base, it just so happened randomly that the amount of time he happened to take to get there is when the Zeppelin came by um, on its trajectory, right? And the Zeppelin didn't really do anything. The AI system in the game can see the whole map, right? And so the Zeppelin is just there to like add some, some art to the game. But what happened was as he saw the Zeppelin, he got a little spooked and he moved over to the side and that happened to be the area that triggered units to attack, right? So some units were spawned uh, and, and then they came and attacked him. And after he was done, he, like, he finished the level, he said, wow, I think the, the AI programmer's name was Brian. And he's like, wow, Brian, that's amazing. Like, I, I got to the place, the AI system scouted me with the Zeppelin, and then it built units and sent them, like, at the perfect time, right? Completely misunderstanding what the AI system was actually doing, but attributing all of this intelligence to, like, the system. And the AI programmer was just like, yes, yes, that's exactly what happened, like, that's totally what I meant. So obviously it wasn't, but like, it's really cool when people interpret intelligence from the things that you're doing, right? And sometimes the things that look intelligent aren't necessarily intelligent, but that makes for a fun experience for the player. So some key game AI ideas are to communicate the AI effectively to the player. Like make sure it knows what's going on in your AI system. Use audio, video, any sense that you can. If you could have a hand come out and smack the user in the face, that might be a good idea. 
only simulate or build what you can c effectively communicate. Do not build entire systems that the player won't see. And entertain and engage the player with the AI. The goal shouldn't be to slaughter them, right? Don't have like, if you're writing a game like, um, you know, Overwatch or Quake and you have AI, if you just give them all perfect aim, like imagine Widowmaker just headshotting you every time, that's not a fun AI right? It's got to be, it can't be too good. It's got to be that right level of good for it to be fun. So AI design goals, when you're making a game for, or making an AI for a game, um, you may have something like, okay, let's say we have new players for the game. Um, maybe it has a steep learning curve. So we want a, a new player tutorial and the AI can help um, the players learn the game. Uh, maybe more experienced players want the AI system to give them a bigger challenge, right? So maybe the AI system should be a little bit smart. Um, you want to have an enjoyable single player experience. So maybe you want the AI to not do the same thing every time you play the game, right? Maybe you want replay value like that. Maybe you want, uh, excuse me, there's something in my eye. Something like a, a modular design. So we'll have an AI difficulty settings, for example. Uh, maybe you're writing an online game where uh, the you're going to need to patch the game. So maybe, you know, these units cost a different amount. So the AI has to be robust to that. So it might need to be modular. So keep all of these things in mind when you're actually building an AI for a game. Some of the benefits of game AI outside of the obvious are that you get, hey, you get better in-game AI. So you get more intelligent NPCs, uh, better single player. If you have really good AI, you could actually create offline tools to do things like balance games. Uh, so you could reduce human testing. This is actually something I'm working on in my research now. So let's say you had a really good StarCraft AI. What you could do in order to test your game to see if units are balanced or not is just let the AI play millions and millions of games, right? Don't have humans test it when AI could test it. You could sell more games, right? And the AI, the the game industry is hundreds of billions of dollars now, right? It's like this is like a tangible asset to the world, right? Is game AI? So, and these numbers are all oh, geez, these numbers are five years old. Twenty eighteen was five years ago. Oh geez, where does the time go? All right, so that's like the difference between academic and industry AI. And my research in academia, like what I do for a living, kind of bridges the gap a little bit, right? So I try and stay between academic AI and industry AI. So some of the things I work on, if you're interested, like in talking to me about research or possibly doing like a master's after you graduate or something like that. So one of the things I do is build order planning and optimization for StarCraft. So for example, um, if you want to uh, get, you know, a uh, 15 mutalisks as fast as possible. I have an algorithm that can do that for you. So we have like, the goal is a set of units and we have a current game state. I wrote a build order search algorithm that produces a sequence of units that you build in order. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, the details of the algorithm because I'm actually gonna do that later in the course, but we have a heuristic tree search algorithm for doing that. Um, I also did a bunch of combat algorithms. So remember alpha beta search that we did uh, in 3200? Well, I did that in StarCraft. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Uh, some modifications to the algorithms were necessary. I'll get into the details of that later in the course. Uh, I also run a StarCraft AI competition. So we actually have a bunch of computers running StarCraft AI. This is a, is a photo from actually from the University of Alberta when we had it running in a computer lab. It's just a nice photo. Um, so I've been running this uh, particular StarCraft competition called the AIIDE competition uh, since 2010. Um, so I organize it. We ha held it here in October. We hold it every year. Uh, there's another one at, at the Computational Intelligence and Games Conference and another, another one, SSCAIT. There are a lot of StarCraft competitions these days. We get entrants from all over the world. Um, I wrote a bot called UAlbertaBot because when I wrote it, I was studying at the University of Alberta. Um, it's been around now since 2010. Um, it's sort of like a cheesy bot. It just like sends things uh, to rush the opponent, but it has this really nice like um, modular architecture. So this is kind of relevant to the course and I'm gonna go over this again later in the course um, because a StarCraft bot is a big system, right? So what we did at first or what I did at first was initially write um, hard-coded rules. So it was a rule-based system 
Um, so for example, you know, hey, if I see that the enemy has an invisible, uh, an invisible unit, then construct something that can see invisible units, right? Or if I have this many units of a particular type, then expand or something like that. So what I did, um, initially all hard coded, then I ended up replacing systems with more automated, more intelligent systems. And I'll go into these systems um, a bit later in the course. Um, this is like, okay, the bot did well over the years. Um, it plays random, so it plays all three races. And you'll become more familiar with this as the, as the course goes on, because we'll be writing our own StarCraft bot. Um, I, I wrote the AI system for this game called Prismata. It uses a... Um, an algorithm called hierarchical portfolio search. And I will give an entire lecture on this search algorithm uh, later on in the course. Uh, it's an interesting algorithm. It can be used to play RTS games, all sorts of different things. Um, kind of run out of time here, so I'm gonna skip over some of these details. Um, I also do AI for video game development and design, so procedural content generation stuff. Um, so things like pathfinding, path following, uh, maze creation, level creation, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, tools, like for example, in Prismata, we had these puzzles that you had to try and solve. Um, there's a similar thing in Hearthstone, I think, where you have like little puzzles that you try and beat the computer in. And so we wrote a puzzle solver for the game. And so we could, um, it helped the game designers actually like create the puzzles by having the AI solve them and then they could tweak them in various ways. Um, you know, we have procedural content generation for, um, for levels in video games. We'll talk about that. That'll be one of our assignments. Um, oh, I thought I had another slide, but I don't. So that's the slides. Um, those are some of the areas of, of game AI that are very interesting to me um, and hopefully interesting to you as the course goes on as well. So here we are back at the spreadsheet. That was sort of the intro and the syllabus to the course. I'm, I'm excited to teach the course, I hope that, uh, you know, we can get a fair deal uh, at the university um, and not have to go on strike. Um, and so hopefully the course goes uninterrupted. If there is a strike, I will let you know as soon as possible. Um, if D2L is not available, I will email you. Um, I have the class email lists and I will also post to the Discord. So please join the Discord for the most effective uh, method of communication. Next week, uh, I am immediately on Tuesday going to be talking about the project, um, how you do that, and um, hopefully you can get started with that as soon as you want. And then on Thursday, I'll be, we'll be jumping right into assignment one before we've learned anything. So thanks so much for tuning in for the first lecture. Uh, I always have fun teaching this course. Hopefully you'll have fun taking it. And um, I don't see any questions out there, but I'll just leave it for a minute. So does anyone have any questions about the course? Um, are you still out there? Are you still listening? <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully you are. Just to let you know, uh, so I'm actually teaching two courses this year, as I said before. So I'm teaching Computer Science 6980. Because that's a grad course, they wouldn't let me teach it remotely. So I'm going to campus to actually teach that course now. So, um, yeah, so I, I teach another course at 2 p.m. on campus. So that, so that's where I'm going. Um, all right, so I uh, I see someone posted a chicken in the chat. It looks like a chicken in a box. It's so small, I can't really read it, but I don't know how to answer that. Uh, someone said, good evening from Singapore. Hello. Um, this guy is a AAA game studio all by himself. Oh, thank you for the, for the kind words. I assure you I am not, though. Um, all right, so there's no questions out there. Thanks so much for tuning in, and um, I'll see you in the next lecture on Tuesday.